All right, and we are live. I'm going to drop the YouTube link in the chat so everyone can share it if they so wish. And I'm going to go ahead and post that on SciStar, your social media networks, just share the excitement. Yeah, well, and it's I want to wish everybody happy um, Citizen Science Month, also happy Library Week as a retired librarian. That's always a good week to celebrate and the wonderful services our libraries offer even while closed um, due to the COVID-19, but they're offering lots of uh, electronic resources. So hopefully everybody's taking advantage of those. Okay, if you've just joined us, please open your chat, usually found at the bottom of your screen, and let us know um, what town and state you're from. Thank you for joining us. And please use chat um, to ask questions, make comments. Um, please don't hesitate to ask questions and we'll try to address them as quickly as we can during this webinar. Great. Thanks, Deb, for weigh, uh, weighing in where you're from. Great. Everybody's starting to communicate on chat. Again, use the chat at the bottom of the screen to let us know what city and state you're from, and also a great place to add questions. Great. Thanks for letting us know who you are, where you're from. And we'll be probably waiting for a couple minutes before we start. Again, if you're just joining us, happy Citizen Science Month. We're providing this webinar today with the help of SciStarter Islandwood and um, in Bainbridge to get everybody involved in citizen science. All right, I'm posting our YouTube link because we're live on YouTube, everybody who's here. I'll post it in the chat again, too, if you want to spread the word to your friends who may not be in the Zoom room. Um, we're trying to get as many people as possible um, tuning in and learning about all the stuff we're going to tell you today. OK, <clears throat> looks like we're getting a good Bainbridge contingency joining us today. Thanks for coming in. Awesome. Okay, if you're just joining us, thank you um, for putting the city and state <clears throat> you're joining us from. It looks like pretty much everybody's from Washington. That's wonderful. And if you could do your zip code too, that really helps us um, figure out who we're reaching, um, you know, what places we may need to reach more, things like that. Yeah. And if you're new to, thank you for the zip code. If you're new to Zoom, um, your chat typically is at the bottom of your screen. If you just touch your screen or click on your screen, you should see that chat feature. We're going to have you muted and, oh, what grade do you teach, Amy? Are you a, a teacher? If so, let us know what grade you teach. Um, we'd like to um, have you communicate with us through chat. Perfect, great. Oh, great, a grade five teacher, wonderful. I think you're gonna find a lot of good information on today's program. All right, we got somebody from Olympic College. Wonderful. All right, I think we can go ahead and get started. How's, every, how's that sound, everybody? Sounds good. 
Great. And um, for those who just joined, who um, might be in the audience, just so you know, we are recording and we are streaming live to YouTube. Um, so if you want to spread the word about that, feel free. Um, I'll drop the YouTube link in the chat one more time, just so you can share it with your friends. And the recording will be available on YouTube after we're done presenting. All right. Uh, okay. Oh, Robin? Um, I just want to say that we have some great resources, um, websites we're going to share with you too. So um, because you're registered in the next day or so, you will get an uh, email with documentation with links to all those great uh, websites we're referring to today. Oh, did you see it says video unavailable? That's strange. It says we're streaming live right now. Let's see. Nope, it's, it's live for me. Um, sometimes YouTube can be a little glitchy. I can see Robin's mouth moving in the video. Um, <laughs> so I think we're I think we're working now. So sorry about that. That's what we get for having everyone use the internet at the same time uh, during self quarantine. Okay, okay let's, so let's get started. Yeah, sounds good. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, so, hey everyone, I'm Caroline Nickerson. I'm a program manager with SciStarter. Uh, I'm so delighted today to be able to learn from Mary, Nam, and Robin, and I'll go ahead and let them introduce themselves really briefly. So Robin, do you want to get us started? Sure. Um, my name is Robin Salthouse. I live in Kingston, Washington now, formerly of the Phoenix, Arizona area, so I'm learning a whole lot as well today and I'm working with SciStarter to help provide wonderful citizen science information and resources. Great and Nam do you want to briefly introduce yourself? Yeah hi good morning everybody my name is Nam Su I work with Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. I actually have to admit I don't live on Kitsap I live across the Hood Canal um, in the Olympic Peninsula lovely place and I look forward to speaking with everybody today. Great and then Mary will you introduce yourself? Good morning. My name is Mary Meyer. I'm the Community Education Manager at Islandwood. Um, Islandwood is a um, nonprofit education, environmental education organization on Bainbridge Island that does work in greater Seattle. Great. Wait, what did you say, Mary? Greater Seattle and Kitsap County. Great, great, great. Yeah, and for I think most of the people here um, on the line are from Washington State. And even if you aren't, if you're just here to learn about Washington State, that's great. And there are some things that you'll hear about today that are applicable worldwide, like iNaturalist. So we'll just go ahead and get started. So Citizen Science Month, um, it's a global thing. We have participation on multiple continents. Um, and Citizen Science Month happens because of the hard work of SciStarter and its partners, including Arizona State's School for the Future of Innovation and Society, the National Library of Medicine, the Citizen Science Association, the um, Science Friday um, nonprofit, as well as um, National Geographic. So it definitely takes a village and um, so many great event organizers and citizen scientists who put all this together. And basically the whole purpose of Citizen Science Month is to get people doing citizen science, our real scientific research. and. Before the pandemic, we were planning on having a bunch of in-person events for Citizen Science Month, which is all through April. So we were going to um, have events all over the world. People were going to come together. We were really excited about it. And of course, there were going to be some online events, but it wasn't our main focus. But now um, Citizen Science Month is completely online. And I know I, for one, have been really grateful for the opportunity to still connect with people and do citizen science because um, so many projects are perfectly set up for you to be able to do it on your in your backyard or do it while you're taking you know a safe walk and following public health guidance. Um, some projects are completely online, um, like stall catchers, which you hear about later today. Um, and I just really enjoy these live events um, that we have online because I'm still like I'm personally self quarantining alone, so I find these really educational, and I also love interacting with you all in the chat. So. As you listen to this, as you hear about this, even if you're watching the recording afterward, don't be afraid to leave a comment or get in touch with the SciStarter team. We'd love to hear from you and we're so grateful that you're involved in this work and that you're moving scientific research forward. So citizen science, it's a collaboration between scientists and those of us who are curious, concerned and motivated to make a difference. So this can be um, 
everything from discovering new species or documenting the biodiversity around you with the iNaturalist app to um, speeding up the search for a cure to Alzheimer's disease with the stall catchers game, um, which you'll hear about later in this presentation. Citizen science accomplishes everything from astronomy to zoology, every field of science. And basically it's any time when a member of the public, someone who may not have even graduated high school or has no background in science at all, is able to be meaningfully part of science and move research forward. I'm gonna really briefly show you all these statistics because I think these numbers really make the case for what we're gonna do today. So citizen science impact by the numbers. Um, there are over, when this video was made, it was 2000 projects, but there are over 3000 projects listed on SciStarter. One of them's eBird. Um, you won't hear about that as much today, but it's a really popular project with the birding community. And it's actually one of the leading um, indicators of climate change. The Christmas bird count, for example, the National Audubon Society's um, famous project, that's really important in knowing how seasons are changing, how birds are changing their migration. Because of citizen science, we know that um, uh, plants are flowering nine days earlier than they were before. Um, we understand butterflies and moths because of iNaturalist. 92% of records in the global, um, a global facility are from iNaturalist. And then, of course, citizen scientists, they save researchers time with their um, selfless volunteer work. They move it all forward. So that was kind of the quick overview. You can also find this video on our YouTube channel. But um, as you can see, citizen scientists have a real impact. This volunteer work um, makes so much more research possible. So this um, webinar, um, this online event, is part of Citizen Science Month. And you can find events every day of April on citizenscienceMonth.org and featured projects for every day of April as well. Um, so this is just a website that you could share with your family and friends if you wanna get them involved. Or if you wanna plan your own online event, you know, maybe do a meetup where everybody um, can send observations to iNaturalist at the same time. Not a physical meetup, of course, a virtual meetup. CitizenScienceMonth.org is the place to register those online events or to find those online events to participate in. And we also wanted to mention the field guide to citizen science. If you go to scistory.org forward slash events, or if you go to citizenscienceMonth.org, you'll see that there's an event tomorrow, a virtual story time, with um, one of the co-authors of the field guide to citizen science, um, Darlene Cavalier, who's also the founder of SciStarter. Um, Darlene also earlier um, visited um, Eagle Harbor Book Company, one of the local book companies um, in your area for many of you who are tuning in in um, you know, the Kitsap County, Bainbridge Island area. Um, and you can also still order this book online from Eagle Harbor Book Company. And um, I understand that there's free or reduced shipping. And I just wanna say what, um, when I visited Eagle Harbor Book Company, it was such a wonderful, warm, welcoming place. And if you do wanna read the Field Guide to Citizen Science, I recommend either you know, checking it out online from your local library or ordering it from Eagle Harbor Book Company. So I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Nam. All right, thank you. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna jump in here and give a quick talk about uh, Kitsap and biodiversity in the Kitsap Peninsula. Again, my name is Nam Su. I am the area habitat biologist for Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife covering Kitsap County. And uh, real quickly, as the area habitat biologist, uh, for WDFW, my work specifically is to protect and restore these habitats that fish and wildlife depend on in, a, in our environment. So um, next, please. Great, so uh, some statistics here. I hate reading off the slide, but since we're doing this uh, virtually, I'm gonna go ahead and do this. I'm gonna mention that, uh, that these statistics are for Washington statewide and not specific to Kitsap County, but here's just some numbers on biodiversity within Washington state. In, the, in our state, we have over 3,000 species of vascularized plants. Uh, and as a marine guy, I'll point out that there are 600 species of macroalgae and seaweed, including uh, uh, within, the, within that, there are 22 species of kelp. Um, and if you ask me, I think these uh, plants and seaweed and kelp are probably the low hanging fruits for your city nature challenge because they don't move around and it's easy to, to observe and identify them. Uh, we also have an estimate of thousands of mosses, lichens, liverworts, and fungi within the state. Uh, over 100 mammals, 140 mammals, almost 500 fish species between the freshwater and marine environments, uh, over 300 species of birds in Washington state, 
uh, a couple of dozen amphibians and reptile, uh, reptiles. And what's extraordinary is that we have an ex estimated 20,000 invertebrates uh, within the state and, and specifically more than 2,000 moths and butterflies, which kind of shouts out back to the uh, iNaturalist observations of moths and butterflies. Uh, and I will also mention that a, a large uh, amount of those 20,000 invertebrates, a lot of them are uh, marine invertebrates, such as shellfish, uh, crabs, uh, you know, anemones, things like that. So, so you should be seeing a trend here in what I'm talking about next, please. Uh, real quickly, I want to share a map with everybody. This is a priority habitats and species map from uh, my agency, WDFW. Uh, this, I, I'm showing this map just to uh, give everybody an opportunity to see the various priority habitats and species that have been mapped in the state and specifically in Kitsap County. Uh, there are a lot of purple shaded polygons that sh denote uh, uh, habitats that have been documented, such as shorelines, salt marsh habitats, rivers, uh, streams, uh, wetlands, ponds, things like that. Uh, but there are also specific occurrences. So those are the purple dots that show where uh, observations of, say, birds, rookeries, things like that have been made. Uh, so I'm actually going to go back to this map later and talk about how you can use it during the City Nature Challenge. Uh, but this is just an example of the variety of and, and uh, amounts of habitats that is here in Kitsap County. Next, please. So uh, I want to focus my portion of talk today on habitats. I know the City Nature Challenge is focused on biodiversity, but, you know, I specifically am a habitat guy. And, uh, you know, without the habitat that all fish and wildlife species depend on, we wouldn't have the big biodiversity that, that we have in the state. Uh, and I will also caveat that I will mostly be talking about aquatic habitats and aquatic biodiversity for a few reasons. One, I am trained as a marine biologist myself. Uh, two, I work specifically in, in my line of work to protect state waters. Uh, and that's because of, of all the species in Kitsap County, a handful of the threatened and endangered species either live or are associated with water. And I'm thinking about salmon, uh, trout, southern resident killer whale and other marine birds, such as marble murat, mulets. Um, and another reason why I specifically want to focus, uh, a lot of my talk will be on shorelines and, and the marine environment, is that be because these are what we call biodiversity hotspots. These are areas or these are ecosystems or habitats where you have a confluence of the terrestrial and marine biomes. And as such, there's a lot more complexity. There, is, there are inputs from each environment, from, from the terrestrial environment into the marine environment and the marine environment into terrestrial environment that allows for a lot more biodiversity. So again, that's, that's why I'm gonna be focusing on shorelines mostly. Uh, with that all said, I just wanna remind everybody that during the City Nature Challenge, uh, to adhere to the current social distancing and uh, stay at home guidelines. So basically, if you can't walk to a shoreline uh, and, and you have to get to, into a vehicle to get there, please don't do so during the City Na Nature Challenge. Uh, that's something you can wait for um, until the pandemic's over and you can make plenty of observations in your own backyard. But with that all said, you know, I will point out that Kitsap County is very unique that Kitsap County has almost 250 miles of shorelines. And more specifically, we have shorelines both on the Hood Canal and Puget Sound, uh, which are two very distinctly different basins with their own uh, biodiversity and characteristics. Uh, of all 250 miles of shorelines in Kitsap County, we have a variety of different shore types of habitats or habitats such as beaches, uh, rocky intertidal uh, areas, feeder bluffs, embayments, salt marsh habitats, and estuaries, just to name a few. So again, because of all these miles of shorelines, that's why I'm going to be focusing on them. Uh, but we also have numerous lakes, streams, and wetlands in Kitsap County. As a matter of fact, Kitsap County is unique in that our, our streams and, and rivers are mostly fed by groundwater as we don't have any uh, snow caps that feed or snow melts that feed our uh, riverine systems. Uh, terrestrially, in Kitsap County, we have a uh, mixed forest, uh, mixed temperate forest of deciduous and coniferous trees, so pine trees and other uh, maple and, and alder forests. Uh, what is lacking in Kitsap County as compared to other, um, the rest of Washington is that, again, we don't have alpine uh, biomes or ecosystems, no snow caps, uh, snow melt. 
we don't really have grasslands and we don't really have deserts that, that you see in other parts of Washington. Um, next, please. So I'm going to go back again and talk a little bit about estuaries and shorelines. Again, they are really um, of interest to, to me, and I think they would be uh, really interesting habitats or ecosystems to visit during your city nature challenge if you can get to one without driving, uh, because they are, as I mentioned, confluence of terrestrial and aquatic biomes where life from the upland environment come down to the shorelines to forage and feed, as well as where aquatic uh, species such as fish, marine mammals, utilize inputs from the uh, terrestrial environment. So again, because you have the clash of these two ecosystems, these two biomes, you have a lot more complexity and a lot more life. And that's why we call them uh, biodiversity hotspots. Uh, one interesting fact is that the Puget Sound is America's second largest estuary. So uh, because of that, we have a huge variety of species associated with our shorelines and near shore. Uh, next, please. A couple of very unique characteristics about our shorelines and marine environment that I want to point out during this presentation is that uh, we have a very uh, extreme tidal range here in Puget Sound. If you're familiar and you live in a shoreline, you know that we have quite a bit of difference between low tide and high tide. Uh, as, a matter of, as a matter of fact, we have about 15 feet of difference in extreme low and extreme high tides. And what this does is it creates this vast intertidal environment where there is a lot more uh, complexity or micro habitats for various species of organisms to utilize. There are a lot more niches in that environment, so a lot more jobs or a lot of roles for uh, organisms to evolve into. So as a result of this big tidal exchange and all of these uh, complexities in our shorelines from that tidal exchange, we have a lot of biodiversity, again, on our shorelines. A good example of this is intertidal zonation or vertical zonation that happens as a result of this tide, uh, tidal range. You'll see on a picture on the right-hand side of the screen where you see the different types of intertidal life is stratified or there are zones of them based on elevation and they are all highly evolved to that specific tidal zone. So again, a lot of life crammed into very little habitat because of that complexity. Um, next, please. Another thing that's unique is as a result of that high tidal exchange or high tidal range, we have a lot of currents in Puget Sound. Uh, we also have a lot of nutrients and plankton in our waters. Uh, that's why we are called sometimes the Emerald Isles. This picture on the left hand side of the screen of uh, Deception Pass is a very good example of that. We have these ripping tides and uh, ripping currents that not only move a ton of water uh, between the tidal cycles, but also moves a lot of nutrients and food in the water column. And what that allows is a lot of our marine or near shore and our tidal organisms to just sit there while the tide bring them a buffet of uh, nutrients and food. Uh, and that's what you see on the right hand side of the screen with the hooded nudibranch. And, and even so for the uh, kelp you see in that picture, the kelp are there, they're holding fast onto one location on shore and they're uptaking all the nutrients that is being brought uh, to them by, by the currents. So again, another really unique reason why our, our coastal or shoreline environments are so diverse uh, because of those physical changes such as tides, currents, and nutrients. Uh, next, please. Uh, so jumping in a little more deeply into these marine or near shore habitats, there's one specific one that I like to point out, uh, both because I'm biased and, and I, uh, I done a lot of work in eelgrass, but also because these are really important uh, habitats and there is a lot of eelgrass habitats around Kitsap County. Um, so these eelgrass ecosystems, as you can see based on the diagram on the left, as well as the artwork on the right, these are nursery habitats in our near shore because there's a lot of complexity. The eelgrass itself produces this physical structure that uh, put, allows a lot of nooks and crannies and, or hiding places for organisms to live and shelter in. Not only that, the eelgrass itself is a plant and produces food for a lot of the organisms that live there. Uh, eelgrass habitat specifically is, is important because it's nursery habitat for a lot of species because it um, this eelgrass habitat inhabits our near shore in, in, the, in the shallow intertidal or sh uh, shallow subtidal areas. It's basically a stopping point for a lot of out migrating salmon from our streams or, or a lot of birds that are stopping our, our shorelines or other invertebrates that are, that are um, 
the young of the year. So this is where a lot of young crabs, young fish hang out in. And that's why we call it nursery habitats. It's really important to uh, the juvenile life stages of, of a lot of organisms. Um, what I'll say since I'm mentioning eelgrass is that these are these are eel, uh, vegetation beds that you can see during low tide. So if you want to go out and observe these during your city nature challenge, again, if you can only if you can walk to it, you might want to time it with the tides so you can go out at a low tide and see these eelgrass beds exposed. What I'll mention is that please be careful not to disturb the beds too much. Don't tear it up and walk through it. Uh, but if you carefully comb through the eelgrass, you'll see lots of organisms inside. Uh, and similarly, if you can't get to an eelgrass bed, there are plenty of salt marsh habitats that are similar. Uh, any of these vegetation beds in the near shore uh, will have a lot of uh, biodiversity and organisms living in there. Um, next, please. So uh, at that point, at this point, since I've mentioned eelgrass beds, I want to point out another map uh, 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 that I have a link for on a list of websites that either has already been provided or is going to be provided. This is the Washington Department of Ecology's Coastal Atlas. It's a great mapping uh, tool to look at the various uh, habitats and uh, shoreline morphology in Washington state. And as you see here, I've highlighted all of the vegetation on the shorelines and you see there's a lot of green around Kitsap County and that green denotes eelgrass beds that have been mapped. So. This is another tool, uh, the link is provided, another tool you can use to uh, help direct your city nature challenge to look for specific habitats and species while you make your observation. Next, please. Going back, I mentioned I was gonna go back to this map and talk about it. This, this again is the priority habitats and species map. Again, there's a link for this on a list of websites that uh, that is provided. And again, this map shows all of the documented occurrences of various habitats and species. You can use this if you follow the link that's provided uh, to, to basically direct your observations during your city na uh, nature challenge. For instance, if you see a dot that's close to you within walking distance, uh, you can see what that dot is. For instance, it could be a bald eagle nest or a herring rookery. And you can see if, uh, for your city nature challenge, see if you can make that observation based on what has been mapped. So this is another great tool you can use uh, for that challenge. Next, please. Okay, so just trying to wrap it up here. Oh, there we go. Um, I know I focused a lot on our marine shorelines, but you know, let's remember again, as I mentioned, we have numerous streams, lakes, and wetlands within Kitsap County. Uh, this is just a slide for me to remind you that these are also great biodiversity hotspots, great habitats for you to go investigate during your city nature challenge. Again, these these rivers, streams, uh, wetlands, and and ponds, they are also. Uh, confluences of terrestrial and aquatic environments. So there is a lot of inputs from both environments into each other. And as a result, there's a lot more uh, biodiversity there. These are This is just a picture that I wanna share of a Kitsap stream steward uh, doing a survey of, of some kind on a Kitsap stream. Uh, and on the right, you can see all of the macro invertebrates or what I say is fish food, salmon food uh, that you can find in creek beds um, and make observations of. So that's all I'll say about this. Next, please. And, and also we do have, uh, you know, tons and tons of temperate mixed forests in Kitsap County. So if you can't access a shoreline, uh, can't walk to a shoreline during a city nature challenge, I encourage you to just get outside, get into the woods if you can. Um, and like I mentioned, we have thousands of species of trees, uh, of, of plants, vascular plants uh, that you can identify. And what I will go a step further and say that in addition to identifying it, I challenge you to try to just figure out which species of plants are native plants versus which species of plants are invasive plants. And to that end, uh, some of the links that are also provided, uh, in the links that are provided, I, I've provided one for the Washington Native Plant Society, where you can look up uh, you know, identification keys for native plants. And I've also included a link for the Washington Noxious Weed Board, where you can go look at the list of invasive uh, plants in Washington state. Next, please. Last but not least, I'd like to remind everybody that you all have habitat in your backyard. So if you can't get to any of those different uh, biomes that I pointed out, 
don't feel like you can't do anything at home. You have, there are plenty of opportunities to make observations, you know, maybe put out a bird feeder and look at the birds that come by. Uh, and moreover, you know, think about the things that you can do to make your, your backyard a better habitat for wildlife um, and wildlife viewing. Um, next, please. So I'm just going to wrap up my uh, my portion of the talk with some statistics. I presented uh, statistics on the biodiversity uh, of Washington State earlier in my presentation, but now I want to talk about the, the biodiversity that is threatened or endangered. I'm not going to go through all the numbers here, but you can see on the screen there's a number of various uh, mammals, birds, fish, and, and plants even that are endangered in Washington State. Uh, both listed federally and on the state level. Um, and in this publication that I have a picture of on the right hand side that was put up by the state that documents the status and trends and threats, uh, they've identified habitat loss, uh, pollution or contamination of environment, uh, water quality and availability, um, interruption of natural processes and something else that uh, affects all of this, climate change as the main threats to biodiversity in Washington state. So I ask you all to keep that in mind um, as you go out into these various habitats that support our biodiversity to make your observations. Next. So last but not least, I'd like to leave you with this message and that is simply whether it is on the shorelines of Kitsap County or in your own very backyard, having a healthy functioning and complex habitats, uh, ha having healthy functioning and complex habitats will mean that there will be greater biodiversity. Uh, and for instance, for salmon, we specifically say that there are four C's, clean, complex, connected uh, habitats will provide uh, healthy salmon stocks. Sorry, my phone is ringing in the background, but uh, that's the end of my, con uh, my, my portion of the talk. I'm gonna leave it to Mary for the rest, thank you. Thanks, Nam. Um, that was a great set of resources and I look forward to the handout you created. And um, what a wonderful reminder of this um, amazing place we all live. Uh, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Mary Meyer. I'm the Community Education Manager at Island Wood. And Island Wood is partnering with the Bainbridge Island Land Trust to host the first City Nature Challenge for Kitsap County. And um, it makes sense. I think uh, the land trust is actually actively preserving and, and fighting that habitat loss that Nam spoke about. And um, we'll hear more from um, a representative of the land trust in a minute, but um, they're actively engaging the community and protecting the land. And Island Wood is um, engaged with teachers and students and community members to um, build, um, an environmental ethic and the skills that people need to um, become environmental stewards. So um, next slide, please. So a little bit about Islandwood, if you're not familiar with our organization, we're based on Bainbridge Island, um, but we have programming all over greater Seattle. We serve about 11,000 students each year and 800 teachers and um, we have a school overnight program that's a residential uh, Monday through Thursday um, overnight and the fourth, fifth and sixth grade students from greater Seattle come and stay. And they learn about um, how to be environmental stewards and accordance with the next generation of science standards. And um, I'm gonna give it over to Matt Steinwurzel with the Bainbridge Island Land Trust and Matt can tell you a little bit about the uh, land trust. Next slide, please. Yeah, thanks so much, Mary. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, my name is Matt Steinwurzel. I'm the community engagement coordinator for the Bainbridge Island Land Trust. Uh, and we're just so thrilled to be partnering with Islandwood and uh, SciStarter and appreciate the ever efforts of everyone here involved to bring the City Nature Challenge here to Kitsap County. We just think it's such an incredibly important initiative and as Mary said, you know, we're so incredibly unfortunate to live in an ecosystem like this uh, here on island or if you're off island, uh, the greater Puget Sound area. Uh, so it's important to document this biodiversity uh, from the perspective of just having our community become involved in this work, as well as to better guide organizations and entities and agencies as they 
work to protect our biodiversity and our habitats here around the, the region. So for those of you who don't know, the Bainbridge Island Land Trust was established in 1989, and we uh, acquire land having significant or potentially significant conservation values, such as scenic vistas, wetlands, open spaces, tidelands, forest, unique plant and animal habitats, and stream and wildlife corridors for the benefit of both wildlife and people. So we also work with private landowners to protect their land using land protection agreements called conservation easements. This is a critical aspect of our work. So we work with a variety of partners to acquire land for preserves, parks, trails, and public use. And currently we manage over 14, 1,417 acres of which 1,080 acres are open to the public. So we are a land management ent entity here on island. And as such, this initiative in, in collecting and gathering biodiversity here on island is critically important to us. Next slide, please. So, Let's uh, first actually ask ourselves, what is a BioBlitz? And assuming that most people here actually do understand what a BioBlitz is, that's great. For those of us who don't, a BioBlitz is an intense period of biological surveying in an attempt to record all the living species within a designated area. Groups of scientists, naturalists, and volunteers conduct an intensive field study over continuous periods of time. So why a BioBlitz on Bainbridge Island? Well, as Nam so beautifully highlighted as, long, as well as Mary, our island is home to a diverse array of flora and fauna and it is important to understand the density of biodiversity here on Bainbridge Island when protecting our land. Over the years past, the Land Trust has worked with our partners and we have actually held previous BioBlitz initiatives on our managed lands to better collect data on biodiversity within the lands we manage. With iNaturalist and the City Nature Challenge, what we hope is to use this fun and engaging initiative to lay the groundwork for a future BioBlitz initiative so that our community is well adept at using iNaturalist within the, within the context of a BioBlitz. And as the Land Trust takes a critically science-driven approach to conservation and land acquisition, this data is critical to our work. So you're not only helping increase your own uh, education and awareness of what we have on island, but you're helping better guide the Land Trust's work. Um, and just really quickly, as Nam said, uh, you know, given the current precautions and recommendations surrounding COVID-19, um, what we're encouraging folks to do in participation of the City Nature Challenge is really to observe whatever you can within a walking or biking distance. And as I said, uh, a little over a thousand acres of the land we manage is open to the public. And I will include a link to our property maps to the, uh, to the attendees of this webinar after I speak here. Um, but just to reiterate, if it's too far to walk or bike, then it's probably too far to observe for the context of this year's City Nature Challenge. But that being said, we're incredibly happy to partner with Islandwood and everyone else here to bring this challenge to Kitsap County. And thanks so much, Mary. Thanks, Matt. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, I just wanted to give folks a little history of the City Nature Challenge, if you're new to this effort. Um, it started out in 2016 by the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County as a rivalry between the um, California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco. So it was a big LA versus San Francisco challenge. Um, and then it was so popular and so well received that other cities started to join. And last year in 2019, there was 159 cities all over the world participating, 35,000 people, 963,000 observations, 31,000 species, about 1,100 of those being endangered species. And um, this is the fifth anniversary. So different context. Um, the greater Seattle area started to participate back in 2017. And I don't know if you're familiar with the a uh, writer and naturalist Kelly Brenner, we can definitely share her um, website and um, list of books, um, but she was the first one to lead this in the greater Seattle area. And since then in 2018 up till this year, it's being led with partnerships with the Woodland Park Zoo and Point Defiant Zoo. But the greater T uh, Seattle Tacoma area isn't, uh, does not include Kitsap County. So it was fun to be able to uh, take the lead with this and, um, and start a new tradition. So next slide, please. Okay, so just in general, outside of the iNatural or City Nature Challenge, people have been using iNaturalist for years. Um, this is just iNaturalist um, observations on the map in Kitsap County. 
um, 83,000 different observations made by over a thousand observers. And um, it just shows you that there's already a lot of activity and there's already specific projects established in Kitsap County. For instance, I think the Mountaineers have a bio blitz project for their rhododendron property, things like that. Um, so it's already widely used. The next slide, please. So this is our project, City Nature Challenge 2020, Kitsap County, Washington. That's the title of it in iNaturalist. So any observations that are made during the time frame and the Kitsap County um, boundary will be pulled into this project, even if people haven't joined the project. The motivation um, and recommendation to join the project really is just to see the overall participation and kind of have that sense of camaraderie. Traditionally, this um, City Nature Challenge is a competition. That component's been taken out this year because of the COVID um, situation we're in. Next slide, please. Okay, so how to participate. Um, I wanna just, before I start into this, let you know that Robin Salthouse from SciStarter is going to be speaking next on the functionality and specifics of using iNaturalist. But the first thing you'll want to do is download iNaturalist from your app store. It's free. You do have to be at least 13 years of age to make an account. So if you're a teacher um, participating in today's webinar, you might need to establish some plans with parents on that. Um, and I also recommend another app I'm going to get to um, later in my presentation called um, iSeq, which is part of the iNaturalist. It's easier for more for early childhood or um, early elementary school students. Um, the first portion of the challenge, April 20, uh, 4th through 27th is where you're taking photos of wild animals, plants and fungi. Um, we request that you don't take um, pictures of plants or aquarium animals or cultivated plants and pets, um, but we do encourage you to observe um, wild insects and animals and plants interacting with those things. For instance, if you have cultivated fruit trees in your yard, um, it would not be appropriate to upload those, but maybe insects that would be visiting them. So after um, the 24th through the 27th, when you make the observations, then there's a period of uploading and identifying them all. And um, when you don't have to identify them all, there's a great um, community on iNaturalist with experts and amateur naturalists that um, help identify, plus the app itself can recommend um, identification. And Robin will get into that. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so the observation period, it goes from 12 a.m. Friday, April 24th. There are folks that like to get those nocturnal observations in and it ends at midnight, right before midnight on Monday, April 27th. We encourage you to document common species to rare species. Um, common species are just as important and it's important to create baseline and document change over time, especially when we're trying to learn how climate is affecting um, our biodiversity. Um, this is a time where we all are practicing safe social distancing and staying at home. So insects in and around your home you can make observations from your window, yard, or balcony. I have a friend who has an apartment on Bainbridge Island and she's been observing an eagle nest from her window, um, turning over a stone or a log. Um, we encourage folks to take a lightly colored umbrella or sheet out under a tree and give it a shake and see what insects or um, larva fall. Um, you can put a light out in the evening to observe moths. One thing we, um, recommend to educators is, or parents or to create a sit spot that um, a child can settle into with a blanket. You can take a rope or a hula hoop to create a focused area and you can have the um, student or child return to that same area and create some focused observations. I think Nam touched on this. We want folks to um, 
avoid collecting and handling. And especially in, if there's those eelgrass habitats that are so beloved to be careful um, where you're walking. Robin can um, speak to this, but we are able to um, take audio observations. I don't think within iNaturalist you can record directly, but you could record an audio observation on your phone and upload it to iNaturalist from there. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, once your um, photos are taken, the next phase, April 28th through May 3rd, um, you can upload them to the City Nature Challenge in iNaturalist and then use the Identify tab. Either you can identify them yourself, iNaturalist um, gives you suggestions, or there's an entire community of experts and amateurs that can suggest a identification. So really the deadline is 9 a.m. on Monday, May 4th. Next slide, please. Okay. I think every speaker has touched on this, but um, COVID safety and responsibility. Um, I think there's a silver lining here. So um, we are restricted to our immediate surroundings. And um, I was a kid that grew up in the early 90s. I remember the 20th anniversary of Earth Day and we were talking about the ozone layer and the rainforest. But um, as we've come to understand as environmental educators, kids really weren't learning about their backyards and what was in their immediate surroundings. So um, I love this. I, um, there is biodiversity in neighborhoods and cities. We are part of it, we can affect it. And um, it's great to be able to um, look in your immediate area. So follow your local public health guidelines, stay at home, no driving. I know the Bainbridge Island Park Districts are not allowing folks to park at trailheads or in the parks. Um, practice safe social distancing. Make observations with your quarantine buddies, your family. Um, be aware of your surroundings when you are out. Um, I know people are um, encouraged to keep moving on the trails, don't block sidewalks. And then um, once you do use iNaturalist, if you are concerned with safety because it does use um, exact your geolocation, you can set it to obscure on your settings. So your um, geographic location is in a generalized overall area and not specific. So that's just another safety option I wanted to share with you. Um, next slide. Okay. If there's any teachers there, um, we recommend that you work with your students to first just get familiar with their camera and phone settings that they're using. Um, practice taking pictures. Someone recommended that the portrait mode tends to be really helpful. Um, encourage students and parents to play with the iNaturalist app first before you actually start to join the challenge. If you get in there and use the Explorer tool, Look to see what people have already made observations of. Look at the pictures they took and um, the, their identification. I've created links here to the City Nature Challenge Educational Toolkit in the iNaturalist Teacher Guide. All of these are split out by grade levels and um, create some helpful options for you to adapt it to the next generation of science standards. Um, and then again, the SEEK app by iNaturalist is really great for younger elementary and early childhood. Basically, they take a picture and it I, creates identification for them. It's more of a way to just do some basic exploring. Uh, next slide. It's just a little bit more about the Seek app. And next. OK, so what happens to all this data? Um, Anything that is observed within the Kitsap County border for that time period of April 24th through 27th gets pulled in and rolled up into the Kitsap County page. And then all of that data rolls up into the global project. Um, scientists look at that data to see larger trends and patterns in urban biodiversity and it's used in um, studies and it can create baselines for us to understand climate change. I just uh, shared an article here, a citizen science approach to evaluating US cities for biotic 
homogeneization. That's just um, an example of a published article. Um, let's see, I think that's it for me. Next slide. I'd like to introduce and pass it off to Robin with SciStarter. Thanks, Robin. Well, thank you, Mary, that both you and Nam have created great information um, to create a baseline <clears throat> in this year's City Nature Challenge. So we have um, something to look at as time goes on. <clears throat> Excuse me. And as we participate in this important international event. So this is the web page, inaturalist.org. Um, and this is a tool you'll be using to participate in the City Nature Challenge. Um, this if, um, website and organization, iNaturalist, is a joint initiative of the California Academy of Sciences and the National Geographic Society. It's a platform, both as an app and a website, designed to let people share their observations of nature and create an official record of a species seen at a particular location on a particular day. And the numbers that you see across the banner are changing constantly. So as you look, this number will be old within a day or two. Next. Okay, Caroline's going to queue up this app. It's a um, video. It's a great overview of using iNaturalist. So you download the app, go to your location, and again, remembering all the COVID-19 restrictions, make an observation of all the items, uh, living things around you, take a photo. That's what's happening there. And then you have the option to um, add an identification. I'll go over that a little bit more. It will actually populate some common up to 10 um, possible identifications. And then it automatically puts, um, you can add another picture to add to the identification to make it more clear. And I'll go over that a little bit more. And you can add your own comment here. They're saying, this is my first observation. So you might get some good tips back from the community. There's the place you can change the geo privacy and then note if it's captive or cultivated. You share it. And then the community can start giving it a more um, specific and research grade ID. So anyway, and just know on iNaturalist on the upper left hand side, there's a whole bunch of um, help and getting started videos and uh, FAQ. So make sure you use that after this the, um, webinar if you have further questions. So again, it's um, available through inaturalist.org, the tool. It's available on mobile devices such as tablets and smartphones, and it is a website on your computer. So to get the free app, either go to the Andrew, Android um, store or the App Store through Apple. Thank you. Next. So the first thing you do is you get the app, which will be signified by that little green bird. Tap observe. And um, on a Android, you'll use, I think it's my um, observations tab. And you'll take the picture. Next. Once you um, take the picture, look at it, make sure it's good. You, if you want, you can click on that little plus sign and then add another picture. Um, when you saw it, where you saw it should automatically be added um, with phones and tablets that have internet or data um, as part of their services. Uh, if you are worried about um, showing your particular location, you can change the privacy uh, setting. Save your observation really means just submit it. Next. Once you share it, um, it will sync with the rest of the com community and the whole um, identification confirmation process will start. So it's really fun to keep an eye on your app because it will tell you step by step where you are in the identification process. And those um, 
little icons up at the top will also possibly show you um, conversations that have been going on in regards to your identification. Next. So I wanted to give you an example of something I did last summer. I was in Southern California in the um, Will Rogers State Park and I saw these lizards running around. So I took a picture of it and submitted that identification. So as you can see, it showed exactly where I took the picture at the Will Rogers State Park. And within days, I got a um, confirmation and it will come through your email if you allow it to that this was um, deemed research grade as an observation. Now, what was really cool, and I had no idea at the time what happened, was four projects popped up that this um, particular observation would contribute to. So it was really exciting to get feedback quite quickly that my observation was going to make a difference in scientific research. Next. And what's also really nice about iNaturalist is that I can drill down either through the website iNaturalist.org or through my app to get more information about my observation. So what I found about this whiptail um, western reptile was that um, you know this is its range and it's um, where I can find it. Now that I live in Washington, I probably won't see it here. If I do, though, it might help researchers understand tra changing trends um, with the habitat of this particular lizard. And as you can see from the top, there's even more information on this specific um, re reptile I could, you know, drill down to get. Next. So I also um, could have and can look at the place I was at. So in the previous screen, I was looking at information about the species. Now through iNaturalist, I can look at the place. And the Will Rogers uh, State Park doesn't look like it's had a whole lot of observations. So that might indicate, hey, I need to get out there and do some more work. And I can also see by um, taxonomic groups what has been observed. So it's a lot of good information. Next. So who is using iNaturalist? Well, as you can see, um, over 118,000 identifiers. And again, this was taken last week, this screenshot. So you're going to see a lot more. So if you're interested in biodiversity, you can go on this map through iNaturalist and see all sorts of observations that's being made. So whether it's your local neighborhood, your backyard, or somewhere else in the world that you're trying to get information about species, it's available through iNaturalist. Next. So a couple more picture taking tips. Um, one of the things you want to do is make sure typically that you do get a couple um, pictures of the same observation. It may be difficult, especially if it's moving, to get something close up as this deer that was in my yard. So what I did on the picture in the left was I took it from a distance because they're very skittish. And then before I submitted it through my um, computer website, I cropped it down so the people identifying could get a better look at it. And then again, um, through zooming in um, and getting a teeny bit closer, I got a different angle of the deer because, you know, different uh, features of the deer may be necessary for someone to make a good identification. The other thing you might want to do is um, isolate something that you're taking a picture of, especially if it's integrated with a lot of other items. Use your hand. You might carry a piece of paper with you to block and um, focus the picture on that item that you're using. Okay. Um, oh, and one other thing, don't forget that, <clears throat> you know, just because it's not big and, and um, obvious, you have a lot of uh, wildlife, even in your house. Don't forget spiders, flies, um, any other bug that may make its way into your house could be observed and submitted um, for this city nature challenge. So here I'm just showing you a quick version of the computer, um, a screenshot. Um, what's nice is you can upload your data in the upper right hand corner through the upload link 
or through the um, ad observation just a little bit lower. It also gives you great um, information on what's happening in the community. Um, there's the notification about a temporary freeze on large places. So it's, it's just a good place to um, go in and you can cre create journals for yourselves. Um, calendar if you are creating um, events like bio blitzes you can also um, put them on the calendar in iNaturalist to help promote them um, SciStarter has an events calendar don't forget about that as well next and again here's a little bit more details about um, the uh, privacy settings Mary mentioned earlier typically it defaults to open so when you take a picture your GPS will automatically um, pinpoint the place you were at if you're doing it through the website it's um, easy enough through a map they have to put the location of your observation obscured gives a general idea of where the obs observation was made but doesn't pinpoint it and um, you may even find something was automatically changed to private um, due to um, threatened by collection harvesting or otherwise uh, disturbed due to public's knowledge of its locations so some observations are automatically um, changed to private okay next Um, thank you so much, Robin, for that. We really appreciate it. Um, so to kind of finish us out, and I know some of you may have to drop off and we totally understand. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again. Um, I'm going to lead you through some of the other things that Sci Month has to offer. The City Nature Challenge and iNaturalist are such great ways of celebrating that. So as I mentioned earlier, you can go to citizensciencemonth.org. And this is kind of your home base to find all these different things. Um, iNaturalist, as you saw from Robin earlier, it's an app, right? But it's also something you can find on SciStarter. So it's listed, um, you know, in our many different events down here, as well as um, on our calendar um, for theme days, you can find the City Nature Challenge there. But once you make an iNaturalist username, you can actually go to your SciStarter dashboard if you have a SciStarter account. And you can go to your info and settings. And forgive my slow internet, there we go. Um, and you can put your iNaturalist username. So my iNaturalist username is Caroline124. And then you're actually able to keep track of the number and frequency of your contributions to iNaturalist in your SciStarter dashboard. Um, and you can do that with um, uh, alongside other different affiliate projects. So I mentioned earlier, there are over 3,000 projects listed on SciStarter. A little over 100 of those are called affiliates, which allow you to keep track of your participation in your dashboard. So iNaturalist is one of those. And another one is stall catchers. Um, we won't have time to go into it. It's something you can really discover on your own. But um, stall catchers is a research project that you can do completely from your couch or um, in your home. As long as you have internet access, you can go on your phone, tablet, or computer and classify blood vessels to speed up the search for a cure to Alzheimer's disease. And the fun part is it's gamified. Um, so you get points for the number of contributions you make. And you can compete against your friends, against your family. And you also, because of the power of the crowd, you don't have to worry about getting things wrong because every um, blood vessel is um, classified by multiple people. So Stall Catchers is one of our National Library of Medicine featured projects for Sit Sci Month, which as you see, I went to our Sit Sci Month page. And I just went over to the featured project section. And you can also find Stall Catchers from here and access a video and some detailed instructions. Um, but we really hope that that introduction um, helped you all. Um, understand a little bit more about the awesome nature surrounding you in Washington State and Kitsap County specifically, all the opportunities you have with Islandwood and um, with iNaturalist and the City Nature Challenge, which is just around the corner. You can participate um, this week, um, this weekend. And um, I hope that we exposed you a little bit to all the awesome opportunities for citizen science, everything from astronomy to zoology, and you can start accessing those opportunities and tracking your participation on SciStarter.org. Um, so in conclusion, we hope that you get outside and do some safe science. We hope you join another online event for Sit Sci Month, um, be that the book event we have tomorrow with my, um, with Darlene Cavalier, the founder of SciStarter, talking about her book and leading people through citizen science, or another online event you find on citizensciencemonth.org. And we hope that you participate in the City Nature Challenge, even if it's just in your own home, you know, even if you're just taking pictures of those, um, those bugs or spiders that you find on the walls of your apartment. 
We hope that you're able to make a valuable contribution to science and feel part of something bigger than yourself. So um, I'll end it here by thanking our awesome speakers, Robin, Matt, Nam, and Mary. And um, if anyone has any questions, please drop those in the chat. We will be sending out um, these slides, this recording, and a follow-up document with different links that we mentioned um, via an email as well as on the SciStarter blog. So any other questions from anybody? I did see a question in the chat from Amy about accessing um, if you were making observations and you weren't able to, oh, did someone respond to that? Um, if you're making an observation in the field and you don't have internet connectivity, um, you don't have to upload it then and there. You can do that when you um, are able. Um, we, we are very thoughtful of um, access in general with um, all of our students and that we serve and um, we are able to create a situation where if people want to email us their observations, we can then upload them for the students um, if you don't have a iPhone or something like that. So there are other ways to um, upload it if you don't have a phone or if you couldn't do it in the field, you can wait till you get back. Does that answer your question? Yeah, and, and, and that's another tip as well. Um, <clears throat> things moving things especially like birds butterflies are going to be hard to take with a mobile device a smartphone um, unless you're really fortunate to have some of that really high-end um, uh, photography equipment it may be very frustrating but just do your best um, to to make those observations and hopefully the picture is clear enough that you know one of the community members and I naturalists can observe it but you know sometimes it's just really hard to take the perfect picture for our um, uh, research grade um, verification okay so um, I see another question in the chat yeah. um, D. Sand asks, do orgs like the Bainbridge Island Land Trust use INAT data emissions to government? Maybe Mary or Matt is most qualified to answer that one. All right, uh, Caroline, can you repeat the question one more time, please? Yeah, for sure. Do orgs like the Bainbridge Land Trust use INAT data and presentations to government? Hmm. That's a good question. Uh, to my knowledge, we have not yet done that in any type of presentation, whether it be for a grant or otherwise. But then again, the data that we use for any future BioBlitz initiative could certainly be used in a presentation, not necessarily just to a government entity, but to any entity for that matter that we're wishing to present our work and data to. So it's a good question. And then we have another question from Andrew. He asked, is there a way to curate observations on iNaturalist that others uploaded? There are some really rare or impressive plant specimens on our properties that have already been uploaded to iNaturalist and we would like to hide the points from the public so people don't try to find the points. Mm. Boy, that's so after the fact. Boy, I, I can't answer that. That might be, there is a, um, and, and that's really important too. Um, there are contact, um, emails on iNaturalist. So you might want to contact them and see if that's possible because it is their database and see and explain the situation and they may be able to help you with that. So I would definitely use the contact information on iNaturalist.org to address that issue. Uh, Charles asked, Nan mentioned being careful about replacing rocks slash logs. Any other general suggestions on how to best not damage or disrupt the environments you are observing in? Yeah, this is Nam. Uh, I, I'll jump in here and say, uh, generally just be very careful, you know. Uh, one of the things I mentioned about turning over rocks on the beach, you know, if you find, if you do this on the right beach, you're going to see lots of crabs, shore crabs scurrying about when you turn those rocks over. You might even find some uh, egg casings from uh, dog welts and other gastropods and stuff. You just want to be very careful to, number one, return the rock back to its 
you know, position that you found it in. So you're not disturbing those organisms, but you don't want to just flop that rock over and crush everything underneath it. So you just want to be very careful. And, you know, I would treat, I would treat, <clears throat> you know, uh, rocks, logs, or anything in the environment and all those organisms, like you would want to be treated. So just be very gentle. Hey, Nan, this is uh, Matt. What about any recommendations for folks that are hiking through freshwater streams or systems? You know, depending on a spawning year for a fish species, observing for reds or other type of habitat in that way? Yeah, that's a very good, that's a very good question. Uh, you know, I would, uh, based off the top of my head, this time of the year, I wouldn't be particularly concerned about reds. Uh, for those in the audience that are not familiar, reds are basically uh, fish nests. They're, they're where fish have dug up the gravel and laid their eggs in. Uh, if you walk on them at the wrong time of the year when there are eggs in the gravel, uh, that could do significant damage to those eggs. Uh, but I would say, you know, a short answer to your question, Matt, is this time of the year, I wouldn't be so concerned about reds. But uh, still, just be, be careful as you walk through the streams. There are all those little macro invertebrates living on those rocks. So you can easily step on them and whatnot. Uh, so just tread lightly, I'd say. And then we have another question for Nam. Do Washington, other Washington counties have habitat maps? Absolutely. Uh, the majority of the links I provided is statewide because they're put up by uh, you know, state agencies such as my own. Um, so if you looked at if you look at the list of links and those mapping applications, it, it extends to the entire state. Awesome. Um, and someone said, what is size starters criteria for featured projects, non-commercial? Um, it really depends. The affiliate projects, we received a grant from the National Science Foundation for all of them to deploy tracking tools. And that was to service our community because um, we found through our research that most citizen scientists tend to do more than one project. And I think Robin's a great example of this. Um, as a librarian, she would do stall catchers, you know, a project where you'd be mostly in the computer lab and then she'd go outside and be part of an iNaturalist BioBlitz. Um, so we have all these different affiliate projects for all these different disciplines so people can track all their contributions in one place. Even if they're going somewhere else to do the project, they can go back to SciStarter and see what they did across all these different platforms. Um, so for featured projects, it, um, it depends. We just make sure that it's like a worthy research project. So like stall catchers, for example, we know it's a reputable project because it's out of Cornell University. Um, they have a, a trusted record of, um, you know, being above board, having open data, things like that. iNaturalist, another great example, they're a trusted partner. Um, they've contributed so much great data to GBIF, the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. Um, I mean, you saw earlier in those statistics, all the data that iNaturalist has contributed and helped us understand about the world. Um, so that our criteria for the affiliate projects, it definitely varies, but that's why we're a little bit more selective with those because for those, you know, 100 plus projects out of all the 3000 on SciStarter, those are the ones where people are able to really track their impact. Uh, any other questions from the audience or from our panelists for each other? I guess not. I don't really see any more questions coming in. Um, any other final words from our panelists? I just hope everybody goes out this coming weekend and observes as much as they can and create this amazing um, opportunity to create this baseline for Kitsap County. And <clears throat> hopefully in the future, when this can become competitive again, we can show um, the Seattle area that we're just as dedicated to um, observing and collecting information on our biodiversity in Kitsap County. Ooh, I can't wait for 2021. Uh, yeah, just that uh, we're really depending on word of mouth here. Really anything you can do to tell neighbors, community members, teachers, anyone you might know with within our area about this initiative, that would just be incredibly helpful for us. We're trying to get this thing as big as we can. Um, and then as Robin said, for next year, when our restrictions are hopefully a little less limited, we can make this an even bigger initiative. So thank you, everyone. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. I think we'll end it here. And I hope you all have a great Monday. And a great city nature challenge this weekend. Woo! Thank you. Thank you, Caroline, for facilitating. Good times. Thanks, Talk everybody. to you all later. Bye. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone.